imaging hindsight and a bit of speculation. You know, I, I like to talk about a little bit of the history. You know, I, I say I'm sitting here today because in 1970, uh, the first digital CT scanner came out. And from 1970 to about 1990, the digital scanners were coming out, but the physicians were having to walk to each of those scanners to, to be able to interpret the images. There's no way to communicate the images across uh, to different workstations. You know, ultimately, the physician would, would have preferred to be able to sit in his office or her office uh, and read the studies as they came in. You know, so around 1980, actually, the first standards came out to be able to communicate those digital images. So ACR NEMA version 1. ACR being the American College of Radiology, NEMA being the North American Electrical Standard, uh, came out with the first standard. But as standards go, the first one usually doesn't get very highly adopted. Uh, but that led into the second standard, which came out just prior to 1990. And you know, it was really at this time with ACR NEMA version 2 standards, I'd say Imaging IT was born. Actually, the first year, first time you go to RSNA in 1990, that was the first time you could go and buy a workstation that could talk to a modality of a different vendor. Uh, you know, those, those modality workstations, you know, were given birth. Uh, modality integrations, you know, became something real. Um, you know, at that point, sites were looking at reducing their film costs. You know, how do I scale my physicians to be able to read more images without having them walk between each of the exam rooms? You know, from that, you know, in the early 90s, I like to say it was the PAX honeymoon. You know, every, most, most facilities in the United States wanted to go digital, uh, and, and most did. And, I, and I'd also say a lot of vendors made their, uh, had their heyday. A lot of, if you look at a lot of the executives across a lot of the more traditional PAX companies, you know, even at the, the broader enterprise level, you know, a lot of those, those executives came out of the imaging group uh, in the early 90s. Uh, you know, one of those big movements in the early 90s was really the foundation of DICOM version 3 standard. Uh, DICOM version 3 is what we still use today, and it's really the third standard, third generation of the ACR NEMA standards that, were, that was simply rebranded as DICOM, as we didn't want it to be seen as an American standard uh, and more of a global standard. Uh, but with that, the PAX market was born. You know, what is a PAX? It's a picture archive communication system, you know, picture being the viewer the archive being how we store it, uh, communication being how we move those images around. Uh, you know, those first PAC systems were, were installed in the early 90s. Uh, They're primarily purchased based on clinical buying decisions. You know, as a radiologist, I had a preference for this particular vendor because it had the right tools for me to diagnose the patient. Uh, and, and, and those buying decisions, you know, ran throughout the 90s. This is really the gave birth to that PAX 1.0. You know, as we moved into the 2000s, you know, we started to see a little bit of pushback from IT. Uh, and, and from a buying decision perspective, IT was saying, hold on a second. You know, I have found myself, you know, those early adopters in the 90s of PACs were coming up to their second term buy of a, of a new PACs. And IT was saying, wait a second. You know, I, we had this PACs, but all the data is dirty. And my wife changed her name from Amy Roth to Amy Rice. Uh, and, and maybe it updated in a PACS database, but the files on the, on the storage device still say her old name. Um, you know, the data was proprietary. And, and actually, on, on the comment of proprietary, I don't, I don't necessarily blame the PACS vendors in PACS 1.0 for, for creating proprietary data, but it's hard to move away from it. You know, the PACS vendors, again, the decision, core decision makers have been the clinicians and driving features into the viewers so they'd have the right tools to diagnose a patient. You know, but in doing so, a lot of the PAX vendors were ahead of the standards. You know, grayscale presentation state, annotations, you know, windows width, windows level, different things like that you know, weren't necessarily in the DICOM standard early on, and therefore the PAX vendors came up with proprietary ways of working around it uh, to get the features to the clinicians that they needed. Uh, but those proprietary things have propagated. Still today, many PAX vendors, many PAX solutions installed across our industry and market you know, have proprietary formats. Uh, you know, we also saw in the in the 2000s. You know, now everything's digital. We've moved off of film. We don't have to have a film library. But, oops, I just lost that rack of servers. You know, did I have a second copy of those digital images? And and how do I recover from from a disaster of that sort? Uh, hospital consolidation. We're still seeing a lot of it today. Uh, 
<clears throat> hospitals being bought into larger IDNs, um, and and as they come in, you know, these many of the larger IDNs are finding themselves with many different types of PAC systems you know, across many different vendors. You know, regional exchanges, you're seeing more and more of those at the state level here in the United States. Uh, EMR image enablement, obviously a big driver right now around getting getting everything elect in an electronic medical record, helping to better enable sharing and access of data, helping to, as meaningful use goes, helping to, to better enable a patient to have access. And then lastly here, just around storage challenges. So as we went to the 2000 and the second term PACS decisions came up, you know, there started to be a lot of questions and, and sites ran into a lot of challenges around how they're going to get to that next version of PACS. So PACS 2.0 was born, you know, and, and kind of what was the big thing with PACS 2.0? You know, it was the thin clients, it was enhanced workflow, having more advanced work lists, having reporting built in and tightened and integrated. Uh, and, and I put EMR in, integration there in a, little, in a little bubble as, you know, that integration started you know, around PAX 2.0, uh, but as we'll talk further today, you know, there's there's more room for improvement there. So coming out of the 2000s or 2010, coming into 2010, you know, we start you know we start to see some trends. You know, one from a clinician's visualization solution perspective, we're starting to see visualization tools getting thinner and thinner. You know, going zero footprint. You know, it's not all that uncommon now to see a full diagnostic viewer that does MIP, MPR, uh, 2D, and 3D visualization without needing to install anything. Um, so, and and as that happens, you know, having more flexibility on the devices that you can view on. Um, can I check this patient's emergency case from home before I come into the office? How can I uh, scale and have different viewers across my different specialties? From a back-end perspective, from, a, from an archive and communication perspective, too, we've seen the emergence of the VNAs. You know, if you look at kind of the original VNA vendors in our market, um, many of those VNA vendors started as those disaster recovery archives. As I talked in the prior slide, you know, those DR archives uh, is where really that vendor neutrality started. But we've seen that even evolve. You know, how, can, how can these VNAs provide a bigger role, not only just as a DR archive for radiology or cardiology, but how can it be the long-term storage across all the specialties, across dermatology and dental and ophthalmology and even pathology? And how can we use that consolidated storage then to better provide access and sharing, to image enable that EMR, uh, to image enable that patient and physician portal? Um, and, and beyond that even, how can we use that back-end archive and communication system to better enable workflow uh, between sites and between uh, potentially different different facilities within an enterprise. PAX 3.0, actually, and I, I didn't necessarily, I, I obviously did not come up with this. As I stated in the beginning, I'm a great consumer of, of other people's great thoughts. Um, but there is an article that came out, actually it was almost a, over a year ago now, uh, there was an article in Health Imaging called PAX Dead, Dying, or Being Reborn. Um, I certainly don't think PAX is dead. I don't think PAX is dying, but I do think it's being reborn in a way. You know, and if we look at what, what I've just spoke to over the last few slides, you know, in the 90s we had PAX 1.0. It was really about moving off of film and getting digital, you know, and evolving those standards. You know, DICOM actually came out, HL7, a lot of IEG work happened in the 90s. Uh, and it's still happening today. You know, in the 2000s, we sell PAX 2.0 come out, having that diagnostic reporting uh, with really a focus on that diagnostic reporting workflow, you know, more advanced work list, having better voice recognition and reporting workflows built in. Uh, but as, as we came into 2010 and beyond, you know, we're starting to see that PAX 3.0, the third generation of PAX. And it's, and it's a lot about the business intelligence and the data analytics and the enterprise interoperability around how PACs can communicate and how you can get the data out of it. Um, you know, especially with how payer systems are, are changing, you know, those analytics are becoming more and more important. And <clears throat> although we'll, we will always need to continue to push on the visualization side of PACs, the picture system, um, you know, we always want to provide that. At the end of the day, we're all here to diagnose a patient, provide the best patient care. Uh, but you'll see in PAX 3.0, there's a lot of emphasis on the 
on the back end and the data and how we manage the data. PAX is not dead, it's not dying, but I do see it being reborn in a way. And as we talk about our own solutions here at Mach 7, we, we talk about how PAX can be uh, optimized. You know, as I look at what is a PAX again, it's a picture archive communication system. You know, that picture system, you know, we believe should be, the, from a diagnosis perspective, should be departmentally focused. You know, departments should be able to go in and pick their best of breed uh, picture system. You know, whether it be an advanced visualization, 2D, 3D, 4D, you know, and, and a thick client or thin client or zero footprint. You know, our clinicians who know their specialties and subspecialties best should have some flexibility and control to pick what those picture systems are. You know, from below the line, though, and, and again, that should be the clinical buying decision. You know, below that, though, from an enterprise perspective, how can we, how can we advance that archive and communication system, the A and C and PACs? You know, that archive being the vendor neutral archive, and the communication being that communication workflow engine, that imaging workflow engine. Uh, and the combination of that A and C and PACs is what we really term as the enterprise imaging platform. So actually, as, as we talk quite a bit to our customers, we talk about, you know, what is that enterprise imaging platform? What is your strategy for, for consolidating that storage across your enterprise and, and better providing access and sharing and better enabling the specialists to pick those best of breed viewers? You know, what does that look like within your, what, what does that potentially look like within your enterprise? You know, as we, as we, talk about our enterprise imaging platform, again, it's a, com a component of that is that vendor neutral archive. You know, another component of it is that communication or imaging workflow engine. Um, it is the A and C and PACs, the archive and communication. You know, and with that enterprise imaging platform, we're trying to consolidate across the specialties, you know, radiology imaging, cardiology imaging, dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, wound care, whatever it may be, be able to consolidate that within the vendor neutral archive. Uh, and, and, and to highlight there, you know, it's not just DICOM imaging. Obviously, outside of radiology and cardiology, it's TIF images and ophthalmology. It's AVI and endoscopy. It's JPEG and dental. There's a lot of different formats out there beyond just DICOM. Um, so as you consolidate all that storage in that vendor neutral archive, you know, you then have simplified your image enablement to your EMR. You have simplified your image enablement up to your physician and patient portal. You know, instead of having to do an integration to each of these systems for viewers and train your thousands of users on different viewers, you have one viewer from the enterprise imaging platform to train and deploy and integrate to. You know, but beyond that too is an important piece, uh, and, and I would encourage you, for those of you looking for a vendor neutral archive, you know, I would encourage you to look beyond just the archiving piece. You know, there's a lot of workflow around how archiving happens. Uh, and it's really the workflow engine that really enables, I, I believe, really completes that strategy. You know, it's the workflow engine that enables communication with outside imaging. Uh, it may be with other facilities, it may be with some of the common common cloud vendors out there, such as eMix and LifeImage. And by no means am I trying to promote any particular vendor here. I'm just trying to show a sampling. Uh, but but having an imaging workflow engine to enable better workflow with outside imaging, whether it be auto-generating orders or resolving uh, duplications of order numbers, you know, making sure patient IDs match with your own enterprises you take in outside imaging. And the workflow engine contains that type of logic. Um, you know, beyond that as well, <clears throat> even within a department, the workflow engine can help enhance your current imaging system. So maybe within radiology, there's cases where the workflow engine can resolve discrepancies across study and series descriptions. Uh, maybe it's about splitting studies for chest, abdomen, pelvis. Maybe it's about splitting thicks and thins and sending the thin slices to your 3D solutions and your thick slices to the 2D viewers. Uh, those ties how, how your images flow and really is the enabler around how you truly enable that best-of-breed visualization solution across your different specialties. <clears throat> 